Today I'm going to try to do something a little different. Always a little scary to do something different. But what I'd like to do today is the fifth Sunday, and whenever we have the fifth Sunday, we have the Lord's Supper. Uh, but what we also, be a Memorial Day, I'd like to combine the two. Uh, and I'd like to do the Lord's Supper earlier in the service, just because I think so often what we do is uh, we get caught up at the end and we really don't give its proper place. So I would like to, to look at it, put it a little different place, so we'll have it early in the service, and then we'll continue on with the message, so maybe it'll keep you from falling asleep. We'll have movement around, and we'll keep everybody going. <laughs> but Moral Day started off, if you recall, during the Civil War to remember soldiers on both sides, and it was originally called Declaration Day, and it was celebrated at different times. The South did it at one time, and each state, some of the states even do it set differently. But then it was finally settled that it would be the last Monday of May, and we've been doing it that way for a long time. But it's also been uh, gone on to mean that soldiers, uh, fallen soldiers of any war, uh, a conflict that we've had. And so we've been doing it. It's interesting, the church as small as we are. Uh, how many men of the church have served in the army? How many do you think? Okay, you had nine. How many served in the Air Force? Two. Okay, there was four. How many in the Navy? There's three. And we had one Marine. Down here. Three have obviously gone on to be with the Lord. But you think of a church as small as what we are, that's an amazing number that we have. We'd be very, very thankful that we uh, have men and uh, women who have served our country and to allow us to keep free. But So we think about it, I want us to think it's about Memorial Day because obviously what they've given us, they've given us freedom to celebrate here, but more importantly, we have the moral we have of Christ who gives us eternal uh, freedom. So I want to look at that and uh, be thinking about it. basically three things. Remember the past, remember the present, and remember the future. So look over in Isaiah chapter 52 and in Isaiah 53. Remembering the past, first of all, I would think about the price that was paid and, you know, we... You have different movies, you have the passion of Christ and so on, but nobody really uh, displays it uh, probably as truthful as what it should be just because of what it would be rated. But in Isaiah 52, notice the second half of verse 14 it makes this statement. Isaiah 52 and verse 14. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than sons of men. Have you ever really th thought about it? He was beat up so bad that what? You wouldn't recognize him. And he did it for what reason? For us. He did it for us. And I think so often we don't recognize just all that which you have. You know, often you should stop and think about it. How many of the disciples stayed? You, know, you stop and think about it. John followed from a distance, but needless to say, they all left. But you think about it. He was doing it for them. And basically, you, you go on to chapter 53, and we're very, very familiar with it. But notice you start uh, looking down in verse 3 of Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And notice it says, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. That's amazing when you stop and think about it. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, each one of us turned to his own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet did not open his mouth like a lamb was led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before it shears. So he did not open his mouth. You stop and you think about it. Could he have called 10,000 angels? Could he have stopped it at any time? But it's amazing. He said he set his face towards Jerusalem. He knew, and before and even in the garden, you know, Lord, take it from me, but what? Not my will, but what? He knew good and right. It wasn't an accident. He knew what. You think about the past. The price was amazing. We've been looking a little bit on 
Wednesday night and you look at heaven and so on. How many of you, when you look at heaven, if you got there, how many of you want to come back? And how many of you want to come back and do what he did? So you stop and think about it. Remembering the past, we think about the price that Christ paid. I don't think we should ever forget the price. Because is there anything too great he can ask of us when you think of the price that he paid? So let's go over then to 1 Corinthians 11, which is where we get the Lord's Supper from. Let's look a little bit about remembering the past. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice the proclamation that you have in verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, we'll go through 30, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. But notice it says here, in verse 23, Paul is speaking, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered you, the Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But do this in remembrance of me as present imperative. We're commanded to do the Lord's Supper. Present tense, that notice it says it doesn't tell you how often. It'll tell you often and later, do this remembrance of me. So there are some uh, that will do it every week. And there are some that do it uh, once a month, once a year. Uh, it was voted on before I ever came to do it once a quarter here. Basically every fifth Sunday. That's when we do it. But notice we're, we're commanded to do it. And why are we told it? So we want to be obedient, but we want to constantly remember what He's done for us. It's so easy to forget the price that you have. We're only, like you said, in liberty, it's always just one generation away. So notice that the command is there, but notice the cause. You have three reasons, and I think we often forget about this and why I wanted to bring it to attention. We go through it every time we do the Lord's Supper, but we so often we're sad to say it's at the end and people are in a hurry and we want to go to eat and we really don't give it its proper place. Notice what it tells you in verse 25, the first reason. It, notice it says, <clears throat> in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this is the cup and the new cup and my blood. Do this often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So the first one, we're remembering what Christ has done. We just saw what he gave up. Giving up heaven, he limited his attributes according to Philippians chapter 2. And you think about that too, that's amazing. But he's doing it, remember, what he did on the cross for you and I. The second reason, notice in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the second reason we're doing it, we're proclaiming the Lord's death to anybody and everybody. When it's not just for us to remember. We're on anybody that sees it it's in this service even today. If you have not recognized what Jesus Christ has done for you, He died for you just like He died for me. And we want to make sure that everybody knows that when He comes. And so I think it's important to, to recognize what you have. The third thing that we have when we have the Lord's Supper, and we're obviously we're commanded to do it, we're remembering what He's done, we're proclaiming it to everybody else. But notice also, it's a time of self-examination. You have that in verse 27 to 30. Therefore, whenever whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, and remember he's talking about what's going on in Corinth. They were not taking the Lord's Supper. They were greedy. They weren't sharing. They were doing a lot of things. And so notice that an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. Let a man examine himself so that he eat the bread and drink the cup. For eat, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak, sick, and a number sleep. So they were taking their Lord's Supper unworthily, some of them at Corinth, and they were sick, some of them had even died. It's serious. Now obviously, we, you can't say, well, when we're all perfect. If we're going to wait until we're perfect, would any of us take the Lord's Supper? No. Paul, even when he, after Philippians 4, I haven't reached there yet, but we any time we're examining, you know the Lord's Supper is coming, you know it's on the fifth Sunday. It should be in any time for that matter. But we should always stop. Lord, is there something that I've seen in my life I need to correct? 
That's one reason why I, when we do the Lord's Supper, I don't ever look to see who takes it and who doesn't. Because that is not my place. It is much better for any person to say, I've got a problem with so-and-so or whatever, and not take it. Because if we take it and we know we have a problem with somebody, what are we really saying? I'd rather that somebody see, doesn't realize there's something going on, but God knows. It's always best to recognize do what's right because the Lord sees and He's in our midst even at this time. So we take the Lord's Supper we are remembering what Christ has done. We're proclaiming to anybody what Christ has done. And we want to recognize in our own life hey, if there's something that's not right, now's the time to make it right. Or if it's going to have to be after the service or during the week, don't take the Lord's Supper this time. We're not... You know, when we pass it out, we don't see who takes it, who doesn't, and nor are we uh, have any idea. We're, nobody's on video. We don't go check it out. It's not our place. Because you are answerable to the Lord Himself. So, remembering the past, I want us to make sure that we look at it, the Lord's Supper, what we're doing. And that's why it's important in the same book in 1 Corinthians 6, and notice in verse 20. So we have the price that He paid, we have the proclamation, but then we also have something we're told to ponder. Look over in chapter 6 and verse 20. And they are obviously not living the way they should in 1 Corinthians 6, but notice what it says at the end of verse 20. For you have been bought with a price, therefore what? Glorify God. Glorify God in your body. So when we look at it, we're doing the Lord's Supper. We're remembering what He's done. That's the price that he's done. That's the proclamation. We're telling everybody what he did for me, what he did for you. But we also want to ponder what is he asking or what does he want from me? There is no price that is so great that I should not give. Because not only does he keep me from going to the lake of fire that I deserve, he has given me heaven preparing a place for me even now. So when you think about that, I want us to, to think about it. So when the men come forward, we're going to do the Lord's Supper now. Because I want to make sure I can cut my servant short. But I do not want to do it. This is the Lord's Supper and remembering what He has done for us. And afterward, when the, the men are picking up the cup before we go into the rest of the sermon, we'll let people who want to remember what He's done, you all can speak up. And the question is, are we going to be one of the nine lepers or are we going to be the only one who says thank you? And you stop and think about it, the rest of the service could be just thanking the Lord. If that's what it is. So the men come forward. I don't know which men are coming forward. And as we do this, don't forget this is open communion in the sense that anyone who is after has accepted Jesus Christ as the personal Savior, member and non member, you are part of the body of Christ. You can take it. We simply ask you not to take it if there's something in your life that you need to correct with the Lord you're not a believer because you're asking for judgment. And I believe that He does do that very thing. So we'll pass it out and we'll pray, uh, read the Scripture and pray for each one.
actually remember why are we doing it? Remembering what he's done for us? Remembering Christ. We're proclaiming it. Self-examination. Think about it. It's between you and the Lord. Okay, so we'll do the, do the first one. And when he given the thanks, he broke it. So this is my body, which is in you. Do this in remembrance of me. broken was his body? Beyond recognition. Because of his love for you. In the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it and drink. Remember to me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, thank you for this day and thank you for allowing us to be here together. Thank you for this uh, practice that you have given us. Please help us to always remember what it costs the Lord Jesus. Thank you for all of life. Thank you for being our God and our Savior. Forgive us of all of our sins and help us to be more like your Son. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, go ahead and then you can pick it up. Remember now what we want to do. Just remembering the past. And so I just wanted to open it up while they're going around picking it up. Who would like to remember what Christ has done and be thankful for what He's done for us? Whether it's part of the Lord's Supper or what He's done this past week or whatever it might be. <coughs> Go ahead, Marilyn. Well, you might want to stand up to see you. <laughs> this is the best part. Look at that. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walk and talk and miracle. Yeah. You know? Um, how can I not say thanks? Talk. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's um, it's all because of him. He gave me the peace that I needed, and the prayers from y'all. And uh, I'm so much further ahead than I ever thought I would be. And I'm just eternally grateful. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I'm thankful that he has people out here doing his work so that they can call back people that were lost. I was one of those lost ones and I got called back and without that, I didn't, mean, you know, my outlook wasn't good. So um, I'm thankful for that. I'm also thankful for this past week. Had a lot of challenges thrown at me and with his help I was able to. Yes. I would like to tell you a little bit about something that happened to me a long time ago. Bill was teaching in a Christian school, supposedly this Christian, in Cleveland, Tennessee, and was principal there. The uh, elderly pastor retired about a month after we were there, and the younger pastor took over as senior. And the younger man was completely different from the elder man. Toward the end of the year, we discovered that he was not paying the church's bills because the secretary hid him in the drawer in her desk, just didn't touch him because Brother Wally needed a new roof on his house and Brother Wally wanted to go to Israel and the teachers did not get paid for a long time. Well, I was working, so we at least had my salary, but Bill was not paid for several months. And finally, we decided we had to come back to Oklahoma. This was not a situation that was good. So we packed up our house and our kids and drove back to Oklahoma. As we crossed the Oklahoma line, there was an information booth there, a, a tourist stop. So we, we pulled over and thought we'd get a drink or something and discovered that our trailer had a bad tire. It looked like shredded wheat. Well, the we knew we had to change the tire. But anyway, a very kind gentleman who was also just traveling said, I'll change that tire for you. And while he was doing that, my mother-in-law's pastor walked up and said, hello, Bill. Hello, Francis. 
and he prayed with us so we could to make us feel better. Okay, that was Saturday. Sunday was we, we went to my mother's house and stayed overnight with her. There was a wedding reception for a neighbor who was also a pastor in Tulsa. We, they were neighbors and we loved them. So mother and I went to their 50th wedding anniversary party down First Baptist Church. And while mother and I were gone, my children slept in the back end of the house and Bill was also resting. And when we got back, we discovered that there was a huge limb that had fallen down in the backyard. I mean, it was like a tree. It took Bill five days to saw it up. The tree was completely silent. My kids were not awakened. It did not hit the house. It did not hit the car. It did not hit the boat. It did not hit the garage. It did not hit the neighbor's garage. And I kept thinking, that's God telling us he's in control. How you want to look at it? I landed on the moon. Remember, one said, I don't see God, and the other one said, I see God everywhere. Depends on your perspective. Yes? God gave us strength to make it home from being sick. Okay. Having COVID driving from Washington, D.C. back home. But, uh, okay. <clears throat> yes? I'm thankful for my son making the ultimate sacrifice. So you're in combat, you just don't, you just don't have any idea. If anybody wants to see the picture, yeah. Arlington. Arlington. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Well, I'm just thankful that, I don't know how many years ago it was, but God joked with me and brought me back. I realized that was my choice, but uh, I'm thankful that uh, I was raised with enough common sense to know that God is real. And, uh, I needed to be certain of Him, and I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the prayer voices in this church, and uh, thankful for you. Thankful for your uh, knowledge of God, and we appreciate you. In, in great, you're a blessing. Absolutely. I'll get all, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we're so thankful that our son is preaching today. Yeah. After, after he had the stroke, that he was able to basically return to everything to normal and then not really have any of the uh, lingering side effects that so often happen. Yes. Well, I'm thankful that I worked with Pat and she brought me to this church because I was raised in a church. We never even took our Bibles, much less study out of our Bibles. And I've learned so much more than I could even imagine just being here in this church and learning. Yes. I'm thankful for this church, too. I'm thankful for everybody that's in here. First time I've really belonged to a church. Anybody else? Yes. So, I, I'm thankful for where I am today and where I was. Uh, I could never imagine I would be here 20 years ago, but also thankful for this church's support and uh, this. Foster care adventure we're on. I know you guys have been screaming babies. Some people don't like in church. <laughs> you know, uh, your patience and support and y'all's encouragement because it, it means a lot when you guys see a difference in the way the kids are and, and see them. You know, they're learning and, and uh, it's amazing. They know they was telling me this morning on the way to church they were talking about God and how He, he made them and and that he loves them and stuff and, then, and you don't even think that it, it's sinking in sometimes but then it just comes out you know so, but uh, thank you all for working with us and supporting us and encouraging us and, uh, and putting up with us thank you for what you're doing thank you anybody else 
Yeah. Yeah. She is. Okay, so like I said, that remembering the past, what Christ has done for us. Never forget what He's done. It's so easy to forget what He's done. But also, I want you to think about what about remembering the present? Look over in Hebrews chapter 4. Remembering the past, remembering the present. Notice in verse 14, 15, and 16 of Hebrews 4, thinking of the present, what he's done in the past, makes the statement in verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. Remember in the present, not only what Christ did on the cross, but in the present we have a high priest who's standing. And it's interesting if that if you and I were in his position saying, Well, you, you know, I never sin, I don't know why you I don't know why you are, I don't know why you but notice it tells us there, I think it's interesting. His description that you have, but notice he says to draw near with what? Confidence, but you're going there for what reason? To receive grace and mercy. Not what we deserve. We're going there, to, we're saved by grace, but we are, are living by grace and by mercy every time we go to Him and every time there's a need. I think a lot of times God puts us in places of need so that we will go to Him. It's amazing how many times when everything is going great that our prayer life so often suffers because it shouldn't, but so often it does. But think, think about the present. We have a high priest who's up there interceding. Does he want us to come to us? He's telling us to come to him. You think about it. What he's done in the past, but what he's doing today. Is it? You think about it. Not only is he a high priest, just go over, why don't you look over in Hebrews 13, since you're in Hebrews, just turn over a few pages. Notice in verse 5, Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will what? I'll never desert you, nor will I forsake you. So you have a, presently, you think about Jesus as our high priest. He's also our partner. He'll never, so no matter what you're going through, you may think you're alone, but Jesus is there with you. In fact, what did he tell you in John? He said, I leave, but I'm going to send a helper equal to be with you. If you think about what he's done in the past, but think about what he's doing for us today. There isn't a day, we don't go anywhere without somebody there with us. You may think you're alone. You're never alone as a believer in Jesus Christ. You think about that. You have that partner that's going with you. And then what does he say? Since you have that partner with you and you have a high priest, what does First Peter 5 tell you? Cast all your cares. Because he cares for you. So no matter what's going on, it's easy to get in the place where it seems like nobody cares. Nobody is there. You're all alone. You have a high priest who's there wanting you to bring the needs. You have a high priest who's a partner who is there to help you through it. That's why Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing but by what? Prayer, Prayer and supplication. <laughs> bring some thanksgiving. You know, trust the Lord with all our heart. Lean not on all thy ways acknowledge Him. We have a partner. So even when it doesn't make sense, we are still to trust Him in the middle of it. So you have, in remembering the present, we have a priest and we have a partner. And I think it's interesting when you look at it in Romans 8, you don't have to turn there, but notice in verse 29 it says he's conforming us to the image of his son. You know, you think about it, he's changing us. You know, Brian's already talked about him. All of us who've been here any length of time, we've seen changes in every person for the better. If we will allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, he will change us for the better. And so when you think about it, just remembering the present, uh, are you... Are we 
utilizing the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God that's available to us. How many of us realize there's nothing that catches Him off guard? Nothing. And He's there, ready to help if we'll just ask. I think it's an inch. It's also interesting when you think about the present. John 14, remember he makes the statement you hear a lot at funerals. Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and what? Prepare. You mean he's preparing a place right now? Look in Revelation 21 and 22. Are you talking about one absolutely gorgeous place? And I've had people tell me it's not possible for a, for that gate to maybe be made out of a single pearl because there's no oyster that big. If God wants an oyster that big, He'll make it. Or if He wants to make a pearl without an oyster, He'll do it. My God, when He says that gate, all 12 are out of single pearls, that's what it's going to be. But the beauty is unbelievable. He's preparing a place for us right now. So you stop and think about it. What about remembering the past? But remembering what he's doing for us today. Now I want to think about that, but I also want to think about what am I remembering in the future? You know, what is 2 Corinthians 5? Remember, it says that we must all appear before the what? Judgment seat. Judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we have done, whether it be good or bad. We're all going to stand before him. So think about what he's done in the past. Think about what he's doing today, but remember, we're going to stand before him. And that should have a quite an impact on what we're doing. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says, I don't, I, you know, I buffet my body. I don't want to be disqualified. I want to go through telling people what to do, but then not do it myself. You stop and you think about it. So our works are going to be judged. And 1 Corinthians 3, you don't have to turn there, but it says you're going to be rewarded according to your labor. Different than anything you ever see. Because anywhere I've ever worked, you're rewarded according to your results. 1 Corinthians says He rewards you according to your labor. But then He tells you in verse 13 if it's done to His honor and His glory. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, we don't really know why people do things. But He sees the inner things of our heart and He knows why we're really doing things. And so it's why it's going to be tested by fire and be burned up. We may think it's done right, but He knows the truth. So we think about the future. I'm going to stand before Him and all my works. It's not my salvation that's given an account because that would be based on works. But my, what I'm doing for His honor, His glory, I can get rewarded for it. You think about it, in 2 John in verse 8, it makes the statement, watch yourselves that you may receive a full reward. So you mean you can have a partial reward? You can serve the Lord now, but what happens is so often we're all going into retirement and then what happens? We we go into retirement in more ways than one. And we stop serving the Lord. Full retirement. I think it's important to recognize it, what we're looking at. So in Revelation 22 and verse 12, what does it say? Christ says, I'm coming back quickly and I'm bringing what with me? My reward. My reward. My reward. To render to everyone according to His deed. You think about it. We have remembering the past. What has Christ done for us in the past? He died on the cross. He gave up heaven. He came down and He died. And it was, terrific. it was horrific what He went through for you and I. And by the way, would He have done it if it was just one of us? He would have. So I think it's important not to think about others. Just think about it just in your own self. What He did for you. But what about remember the present? He's a high priest. He's just willing and waiting. Well, often he says you don't have because you don't what? He's ready. He's wanting to help us. What's best for us? We have a present and a future. We're going to stand before him. And I've heard uh, Phil and Francis even on Wednesday night just, I want to hear, well done, I'm good and faithful servant. You and I can determine that <coughs> if that's what we want, we know what we need to do. So think about it then. We look at the Lord's Supper today. Remember the past. What He's done for us. Remember the present. And let's remember the future. 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 And let's remember the future.